Hi, it's Monday, October the 25th, and I am having a blast reading the book of Genesis. Just started it last week, um, and so last week was mostly chapter one, a little bit of chapter two, and last week we had the six days of creation, most of which I think we're kind of familiar with, you know, that there was light and there was darkness, and then there was light, and then... Oh, there's the waters above and the waters below, and then those are made separate, and the land emerges, and all this fishy, swimmy things, and all the creepy, crawly things, and all the growy things, all those things happen on different days. And on the sixth day, um, humanity is created in God's image, and on the seventh day, God rests. Uh, And all through it, God keeps going, and it was good. End of the day, they rest. It was good stuff. Um, So that's what we did last week. And today we're going to pick it up at Genesis 2, verses 4 through 9. So we've just had all that creation. God has rested on the seventh day, hallowed it, so that we would use that as a day of rest as well. And we continue here. In the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there was gold. And the gold of that land is good. The delium and onyx stone are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every fruit of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. There we go. Even with me stumbling on the words there at the end, you still get the drama of it, right? You know? Oh yes, all this is here, and that's the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And almost you dun dun dun. You know something's going to go on with that, um, but that's not where I am right now. Um, it, it seems to me <laughs> that we have a different story now. I mean, last week's story. Um, the six days of creation and God resting, I don't think is the same story with this as this story. I don't think that they're even really compatible. They're, they're to me, very different stories. Um, and I, I know not everybody agrees with that, but I, I just find it really hard to imagine th- that these belong together because, well, so we had things happening in phases in days, light and dark, and, and we had the we had the land emerge out of the water after the waters have been separated into the sky into the oceans. Uh, and here we've got water coming up out of the ground. Um, that seems to turn things around a little bit, don't you think? Uh, we also have um, man being created before we have all the vegetation because... Well, because we're waiting for someone to be able to till the ground, right? Um, it says in that day when the Lord made the heavens, the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. Well, last week, all of that stuff happens, and humanity is created in God's image. Here, humanity is created doesn't say anything here about being in God's image. Uh, And then the vegetation um, happens. So so the order is different. You go, well, that's sort of a minor thing. Yeah, maybe. Um, But also in that that last week, um, God was sort of like making things happen. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw it was good. 
Um, there's a distance to it. God proclaims things, as it were, across the universe. Um, and uh, so, so God is quite distant here. God plants a garden in Eden. doesn't say causes to be created or creates a garden. It says God plants a garden. And okay, again, could be a word thing. Except it also says that God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's not distant. That's God right up close and personal. Um, so for me, this is a different um, uh, different take on God, as it were. Um, there is the distant God, um, let there be light. And then there is this God that is so close to creation that God breathes into the nostrils of this dust create, creation and makes this man a living being. Wow. The King James Version of the Bible, it says, gives, gives the, uh, I believe it says, gives him a living soul, um, which is kind of interesting too, uh, if you want to sort of wonder about things, although I didn't, it's not in this translation, uh, but this idea, so this living breath is, um, uh, the, the, the Hebrew word is ruah, um, which is a word we also translate as spirit. So when we talk about God breathing life into this being, God is breathing spirit into this being. So this might be worth wondering, that might cons worth considering as you wonder. So are, are human beings souls with bodies? Or are we bodies with souls? Because here, my body, my corporal self has been created and the soul put in me. That would be different than perhaps even last week's reading where, where, where I was created in God's image. So for me, that last week, I am a soul that has flesh around it. And here I am a body into which a soul has been injected. Does that matter? It matters a little bit to me when I think about my mortality, when I think about what life beyond this life means or can mean. I mean, when I think about my identity, is my identity associated with my body or is it with my soul? What is it that God loves about me? Is it my body or is it my soul? You hear people talk romantically about, about finding their soulmate. Well, I think that means something. Do I love you for your body or do I love you for your soul? I know that sounds kind of cheeky, um, but just think of the way that the world works. Um, so which creation story you pick um, kind of does make a difference. At least it does for me. And, and, and I, part of me likes the first one because I am, a, for me, I am a soul wrapped in a body. And so I, I want to be loved for my, my soul. And that's my expectation. And I will not be satisfied until um, the people that, that want to love me love my soul. So I have more to share. Um, having said that, I also love the God who is intimate and involved in creation in this, in this other story. Uh, and breathes life into this this dust creation, which is now me. But there, it would seem, possibly, that my existence is that of a physical body into which a spirit has been injected. And so maybe that hope of a soulmate is in vain because I am, I am flesh and blood. Um, with a soul added after the fact. Um, I don't know. It's a tricky one. Um, but there's part of the difference in these two stories. And, and, it, and it raises some issues for folks. For you, you might go in like, Norm, it doesn't really matter. You know, whether the soul came first, the body came first. Um, I'm good because I am my soul. And I don't care, you know, who comes first or who comes second. Um, and good, good on you. I don't blame you. Uh, it's just a thing that I wonder about. The other piece, I guess, that I, I pick up on is is that um, it's a different story. And, and, and I know there are some people who want to say, no, 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 this is just um, sort of a, a, a micro 
um, look at the macro story that was told in the first chapter. Yeah, except that the, the text doesn't really say that. Um, it just really doesn't. In the day that the Lord made the earth and heavens. So, by the way, one day, not six. Um, man is created before the plants of the fields. That is not what it says in the previous story. So to me, right, right now, they are different stories. And that matters because there are people who love to quote Genesis 1 um, as a binding description of the universe. So whether we're talking about when the world was created, whether we're 6,000, 10,000, several billion years old, uh, whether we're arguing about that, or whether we're arguing about the binary nature of humanity. They love to quote that. Oh, no, no, no. There it is. You got to see that man was created male and female. He created them. Uh, and that's what it says. And that's what it must be. Well, yeah, but then right after that, there's another story where he creates them all one thing. And then later will create woman. Now, I know we call that one thing, this first creation man, but really I'm only a man in 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 uh, relation to other humanity so i'm a man i guess in relation to a woman um but if there is only me then i'm just me <laughs> right um and then that's what we had here but 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 yes but last week we had this binary creation so when people insist no 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 it's it, it is binary we're male and female and we can't be anything else and they quote genesis 1 you go yeah but in genesis 2 that's all thrown up in the air. So <laughs> you have at least two creation stories here and you get to choose. Or perhaps neither is meant to be an authoritative textbook, but perhaps both are meant to invite us into wondering and comparing the stories and why does this appeal and why does that appeal? Um, the other one that gets me to it, it then this is, I know this is just me, uh, but you know it, it's the people who say, well, we have found, we have found the Garden of Eden because because we know where the Tigris is, and we know the Euphrates, and we know that's the cradle of civilization, that's the fertile crescent, we know all of that, and we figured out you know where where uh, where where Pishon that river is, and we figured, um, yeah, but if you read a little further on in Genesis, uh, the earth is going to be flooded, and then redone. And so we may name another river the Tigris, but it's not the same river as this Tigris. <laughs> um, so uh, that always sort of amuses me whenever we're uh, I'm watching those very strange documentaries. Yes, we have found the Garden of Eden. Um, how? Uh, I don't understand how that's possible. Um, also because I don't believe that physically there is a Garden of Eden. Um, for me, this is again very much parable. I'm meant to reflect on it. It's meant to speak to me about me and it's meant to speak to me about the world. And in that conversation, I can hear the word of God. I know I apologize. I'm talking in circles right now. Um, but I think it's also interesting though, that, that the author at this point, uh, of this chapter of Genesis, who I think is a different author than the first chapter, just saying, but they have made this local and understand and, and understandable. So yes, the, the Eden is real. They're saying basically, and you know that because because the rivers, the the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, the Euphrates, all this run out of of Eden, and people go, oh well, I know where the Tigris is and the Euphrates. Oh, oh, okay, I get. It. So whereas. In the first creation story, God is distant. Um, let there be light. It is good. Here, not only is God in their actually blowing spirit in, 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 into, into God's creation of humanity, um, but it's also happening locally. For me, this is very much God is near. And I think that invites us as well to sort of wonder a little bit about our relationship to God. When we think of God, is God distant or is God near? Is God out there in the universe watching over everything or is God in, in my heart? 
does God well up inside me or does God make the thunder clap? What, what, what is your experience of God? If you had to describe God right now, if you had to tell people where God is right now, what would you say? Because I think we have two, two different creation stories um, saying two different things. And by the way, I personally don't think they're, exclus uh, they're, they're uh, exclusionary. I think that they actually can be together. I think that God can be out there and, and in here, um, intimately involved with creation, intimately involved with me, even as I believe that God can also exist externally uh, and authoritatively um, guiding creation, which is ongoing. At least that's how I felt about it last week. Um, yeah, that may be a good place for me to stop because I do appreciate that I'm 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 uh, rambling a little bit, but this is fascinating me just as I'm reading it to you because, yeah, I always thought of these as two separate creation stories, but I never really thought about why I thought that, and now I am thinking about why, but I've also never thought about the implications of that, and now I'm thinking about that too. Um, and of course we have introduced the garden, uh, but we've introduced more than that, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's, that's big. Um, but we're going to be talking more about, about that a little more as we go forward. So I'm just going to leave it for the moment now, other than to acknowledge that this is great storytelling. Don't you think? I mean, the way man is created, humanity is created, that there, there is that spirit, uh, that, that, that is, that is blown into the nostrils. Uh, that, that's pretty amazing. And there's this incredible garden that God has created that, that's full of things that look good and taste good. And it's great. Wow. What a celebration except, oh yes, but over there, over there is one tree that you shall not touch in the day that you eat of it. You shall die. Oh, great storytelling. Cause you can't wait to see what happens next. And you know, inevitably, we're going to eat from that tree. You just know it. Uh, if you were the first person to hear this story for the very first time, you'd know that we're going to eat from that tree. Um, and what does that say about humanity, too? Uh, that we are destined to fall? Mm, I don't think that's it. Uh, that we are curious that we don't do what we're told. A um, lot of things are possible on that one. And I will be exploring that as we uh, get a little further into the story. But for now, I think I'm going to give it a bit of a rest and I'm going to offer a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for, for the stories of creation. We thank you for the ways that they draw us in and, and inspire us to wonder. Wonder about you. Wonder about ourselves. God, we ask that all the wondering we do today, we ask that it, that it excite us, not frighten us. We ask that it, that it draw us deeper into the mystery, not, not make us shy away. We ask God that today's wondering help us grow in faith. We pray through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's it for me today, but I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow. Until we do check in, please know that you are blessed. God sees you. God loves you. God's love moves through you. Creation is ongoing. You're part of it. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.